Okay. Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the Library of Congress portion of uh, reports and presentations. Uh, my name is William Kopecki. I'm the field director for the Library of Congress's office in Cairo, Egypt. And I'll start off with the report from uh, Cairo office. And as always, we start off with Huna al Qahira. So, hello from Cairo. As always, for the benefit of those who are new or attending for the first time, this is the report of the Library of Congress's overseas office in Cairo, Egypt. My focus is going to be on the Middle East Cooperative Acquisitions Program, one of six regional programs operating under the authorization of the United States Congress to acquire, catalog, preserve, and distribute library and research materials from countries where such materials are essentially unavailable through conventional acquisition methods. So we call these CAP programs. CAP programs allow the Library of Congress to make these books and serials available to other librarians or other libraries on a cost recovery basis. This is a look at the uh, six overseas offices and the countries they cover. Here's specifically the countries that are covered by Cairo office, which you can see is as far west as Mauritania, far east as the Gulf, Turkey, Sudan, and everything in between. So what's been happening? The enhanced technology that we've been using since the outbreak of the pandemic has made it possible to communicate with many of you uh, throughout the past year. So as always, I'd like to use this moment to introduce our head of monographs, Khaled Riyad, and head of serials, Ahmed Mustafa, and to report that we're ready to meet with you at any time for any one-on-one -on -one consultations. And for those of you attending who are new to the program or new to uh, want to know more about what MACAP is, please do contact me and we can schedule a meeting. So as the administrator and operator of MACAP, Cairo office worked over this past year under the current circumstances to continue to receive and fill orders for publications made by you, our participants. To give you an idea of what we acquired over this past physical year, uh, we were able to get a little more monographs, a little more serials, all for a net cost of uh, $243,664.132. Uh, 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 and this is kind of reflective with the number of shipments that we've been able to receive uh, over the past year that were otherwise held and delayed from the previous physical year. So there's been an overall increase in the number of pieces acquired from MACAP participants, which again demonstrates the office's commitment to help build the national collection of library materials for the countries uh, we cover. So with the start of the new US government fiscal year, which just started in October, uh, we are currently closing out the previous fiscal year 2021 and finalizing the cost recovery exercise that is going to determine the percentage rate of indirect and overhead charges that we add for uh, your invoices. And this will be effective in 2023. Now, of course, this past year, we were at 31%. And honestly, we have not quite finished the cost recovery process. So I do not know yet what the uh, indirect and overhead rates are going to be for 2023. Uh, I would to be honest, imagine a slight increase over this year simply because we are operating under pandemic times and the costs of everything, uh, the cost of doing business basically is going up and these things work against us. However, I will stay, say and will continue to say that the more orders we're able to fill for you, MACAP participants, the easier it is to you know, help keep those rates down. Uh, so in all cases, I would like to thank our head of accounting and financial manager, Mohamed Fakhri, for his efforts to do all the bookkeeping and keeping uh, MACAP participant accounts accurate and, uh, and correct. So because of the pandemic, staff could not make any acquisition trips this past year. However, Calvin Nathman worked with our various suppliers and encouraged them to send uh, whatever they could, as quickly as they could, using whatever means necessary, 
so that we could be able to ship things to you. So if you want to look just for example, uh, some of the more challenging countries we were able to receive for MAKEP uh, participant libraries this past year, Iraq. We were able to get some shipments from Iraq with 756 pieces for MAKEP participants and 150 serial pieces from MAKEP participants. I won't read through all of the statistics here, but uh, it is worth mentioning that Mauritania uh, by itself reaped an amazing, extraordinary amount of acquisitions. Uh, for Library of Congress alone, we acquired 146 new titles. And then for monograph, uh, sorry, for MACAP participants, that translated into you know, some 1,300 monograph pieces there. And that was, that was really amazing. We never had so much from Mauritania uh, ever before. Uh, as always, the goal of the office when we are doing acquisitions work, we are trying to find multiple channels of acquisitions to ensure a steady supply of publications from some of the most challenging countries in the region that Cairo office covers. We are engaging with new suppliers for the Gulf countries, and here specifically I mean uh, United Arab Emirates, Oman, Qatar, and Bahrain. We are also extremely fortunate to have a Cairo International Book Fair. Uh, the Cairo Book Fair, uh, as you know, was canceled uh, in January 2021, and they decided somewhat at the last minute to have it during July. So this was an incredible opportunity to collect new publications from several countries we deal with, not to mention Egypt. Uh, and so that actually supplanted the uh, shipments that we were able to acquire directly from our suppliers and country of origin. Uh, looking ahead for next week, uh, Khaled Ahmed and I are going to travel to Sharjah for the Sharjah International Book Fair. This is a really important book fair, which continues to emerge as, you know, the probably the second most important book fair in the region, I would, I would have to say. Uh, so we're going to be visiting that next week, starting next week. So if you have any special requests or things you would like us to look out for, please do feel free to contact me. Uh, in reflecting on the theme of the past year, and I will say, and I will continue to say that supply chain logistics are one of the most uh, critical aspects. By the way, this is Syrian authors publishing in Turkey. That was a great highlight of Cairo 2021 book fair. Look for more of that soon. But going here, when we talk about shipping, uh, it is really one of the most critical factors uh, that we deal with. Basically, how do we get a pallet of books and magazines from one country of origin to Cairo office and then outbound again to the United States and our MAKEP participants? And while the blocking of the Suez Canal by the container ship Evergreen provided a period of memorable memes during this past year, the headline news that we see today, even what I saw with my own eyes when I was able to spend some time in the US uh, this past summer, it really revealed to me that transportation and shipping industries are crucial to the work of library acquisitions everywhere. So when we talk about shipping to you, MAKEAP participants, I'll just say here that uh, with your own libraries reopening, we were able to get the green light from everyone in order to resume shipping. So statistically speaking, we were able to send you 657 boxes which of which 425 were monographs, 232 boxes were serials for a total of 12,958 pieces with a total weight of 11 tons. So if, to picture what 11 tons might look like, it's roughly 11 four by four pallets with some 50 to 60 boxes on each. It's usually enough to fill two of those DHL vans that you see in the lower uh, left-hand corner of the screen. But everything in that regard is manually prepared by our wonderful shipping staff, packed with care, and moved out at each holding stage until they depart Cairo International Airport and arrive to your library. In our office, or in Mailer, really, over the course of the Mailer meeting, many have reported 
on the impact of the pandemic on our oper on their operations. So I'll use this opportunity to give a brief update since what we've been doing the last time I gave this report. Uh, by November 2020, we were at peak telework conditions with only critical on-site staff. However, when new shipments started arriving, we had to redouble our efforts to have acquisitions and cataloging staff and receiving and even shipping staff be able to come in a little more frequent and increase their ability to uh, produce so that we can process those shipments and suppliers get paid. We faced a couple of scares with staff being exposed to COVID-19 and thus those people were required to quarantine or self-isolate themselves. And if there were a couple of instances where contact tracing discovered that other people in the office or in a section were exposed, so it required multiple people to uh, self isolate. However, by the time of April 2021, the health unit of the embassy received the Pfizer vaccine and were able to quickly deploy it to both American and Egyptian local staff. By the start of the summer, all staff in the Cairo office were fully vaccinated, and now we are anticipating receiving the third dose vaccine shot sometime in November. As I say these words, we have most of the office reporting for duty on a daily basis, for me, I'm there every day of the week, uh, but in some cases, we may allow telework depending on the person's, uh, the nature of a person's work or the priorities in the office uh, at the time. In terms of staffing of the office, this past physical year, we onboarded two new monograph catalogers and a receiving clerk slash driver, as well as a long awaited IT assistant. On the other hand, we are losing two staff, one due to retirement and another who will immigrate to the United States on a special immigration visa. Uh, and we were very sad when we lost one of our longest serving serials librarians, Yusri Gerges, who passed away in August. So for contact information, you know to contact us at these addresses. Uh, I apologize, I kind of recycled some of this presentation from last year in terms of the photos, uh, but honestly, 2020 was a blank. <laughs> so I hope you don't mind using some of those again. So now, finally, on a final note, I would like to use this occasion to announce something. As many of you know, I have been serving as acting field director for our office in Nairobi for the past year. Recently, Library of Congress management in Washington have asked and I have agreed to spend the next three years doing a tour of duty in Nairobi as the new field director there. During this transitional period, I will still continue to run Cairo office as field director until my successor can be found and sent here. For me, both professionally and personally, this is a very bittersweet uh, feeling. Uh, to, to think about moving. Those of you who know me personally know that Egypt and its people are a part of my life forever. However, I'm excited for the new opportunities and possibilities for having a fresh look at acquisitions from Sub-Saharan and Horn of African countries in particular uh, that my presence might enhance. Uh, some of the more senior Mela members will recall the joint meeting we've had between Mela and the Africana Librarians Committee in 2005, and with some of you also having uh, acting or permanent roles in your library's Africana sections, I especially look forward to working with you via Africa. In any case, I want to I want to assure you that Cairo offices operations will continue to stay on course. So just like the River Nile, we will keep on keeping on in a forward moving direction. And this is again, thanks to the great staff that you see here, Mohammed Khaled, Ahmed and Amr, as well as their own staff of all 34 of us who work in the office. So I just wanna make a little plea to those of you who might find this work as being a field director for an overseas office interesting. I, if any of you are interested, please contact me. This is a job unlike any other traditional librarian job you may be working now or may think you have. It is the toughest job you will ever love, but the rewards uh, are immeasurable. 
that is kind of my report. I thank you, everyone, for your support of Cairo Office, the MAKEP program, and myself. Our aim is always to serve you as best we can. If you have any questions, you can ask in the chat, or you can ask now or whenever. For the past 12 years, I have been William Kopecki, Field Director for Cairo Office. Thank you. Uh, do we, are we wanting to leave questions at the end or after each presentation? William? This is a good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe questions after each presentation might be best or? Yes. So I'm looking just in a, the chat. Just a quick thing too to be sure that um, Hong has an opportunity to present. Yes. So maybe short questions and then maybe later more. Correct. Yes. Okay. So any questions? Just want to say, William, um, best of luck. Thank you for all you have done. We will miss you dearly, but we really are already looking forward to the day when you return. Thank you. Me too. Michael, did you have a question? Okay. Okay. Oh, there, will be an, there will be an annual report going out, uh, and I will send it to all makeup participants. Thank you. All right, Phil, would you like to go ahead? I'm, un I'm unmuted now, correct? Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good, good evening. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me already, my name is Fel Cannon. I'm the field director for the Library of Congress office in Islamabad. Um, that office, um, quickly, that office is responsible for acquisitions from uh, Pakistan, Iran, and Afghanistan. Last week, um, in preparation for the CONSOLD meeting and then this meeting tonight, I sent out a copy of my full report to the participants, for the, the PIA CAP participants for our office. Uh, if you have, if you are a PIA CAP member and um, have not received the report, or if you are interested in receiving the report and you currently aren't a member of PIA CAP, just send an email message to me afterwards and I will get the re full report to you. Um, in the interest of time tonight, I thought that what I would do is just pull out some of the highlights from that report and then leave a few uh, minutes for questions if anyone in the group has, has a question. Um, as William mentioned, the Library of Congress uh, financial year started with the signing of a continuing resolution that keeps the government open from October the 1st until December the 3rd. Um, as a result, we um, immediately began to complete renewals for all of our book vendor and bibliographic representative contracts. And we were able to start placing orders for the program early last week. Staffing, an update. Uh, in the past year, there, has, there have been some significant changes to our office staffing levels. Uh, between July and September of 2021, our office lost three senior staff members, two senior catalogers, and our only budget analyst, two resignations. Um, these staff members resigned in order to take, um, to make use of special immigrant visas, which they had received earlier this year. Our office did receive approval to fill two of the above vacancies, uh, one budget analyst and one cataloger trainee. Uh, we were also granted permission to double encumber funding for the transition between the outgoing and incoming budget analysts. Uh, this permits, permitted Mr. Bakshish Alahi to spend his last three week, six weeks in the office training his replacement, Mr. Sajid Abbas, 
Uh, Mr. Abbas has worked for LC Islamabad office as a budget technician for the last several years, acquiring extensive experience with PIA cap revolving and LLC appropriated funds. Uh, this experience has helped to maintain office workflow and operations as we adjust to Mr. Allahi's resignation and complete Mr. Abbas's training. The second approved hiring is now underway. The vacancy announcement has already posted and actually just closed a few days ago. Um, we anticipate that the selected candidate, which would be someone to fill a cataloging position, will have to come from outside of the embassy's staffing pool. Uh, this means it is likely to take five or six months to complete the entire hiring process and bring the new employee onto payroll. Um, <clears throat> An update acquisitions travel in our office in FY 2021, LC Washington had approved funding for our office to complete eight acquisitions trips in Pakistan. Unfortunately, funding for these trips did not translate into embassy's approval for LES to travel at this time. Still two of our office's acquisition staff live in the cities of Lahore and Peshawar. Unofficially, they conducted brief visits to a limited number of uh, publication sources in those cities to pick up titles that had been requested in advance by email. Going into FY 2022, I have again requested funding to complete eight outstation acquisition trips in Pakistan. If funds are approved for acquisitions travel, our office will then seek embassy approval to make these visits. So how is our office coping on site with COVID? Um, we are well into our second year of operations under the US Embassy Islamabad's social distancing guidelines for the compound. Uh, these guidelines include restrictions on daily on-site staffing levels for each US government agency at post. Initially, agency heads at post were instructed not to exceed on-site staffing levels of 20% of their full authorized levels of staffing. Um, after all U.S. Embassy Islamabad staff had been fully vaccinated for COVID-19, these caps were raised. And I'm, I'm happy to say that since April, LC Islamabad on-site staffing levels average about 60% of full staffing each day. Um, we've actually, unlike Will, what William had mentioned, we have been told to try to maintain this level for the time being. Um, the compound is also scheduled to, actually I take that back, have already begun to receive um, the booster shot, the Pfizer booster shot. So I'm hoping that by the end of this calendar year that we will be allowed to bring full staff uh, back to the office. As I was preparing for this meeting today, I received the Islamabad Supervisors sections for the FY 2021 annual report for our office. And I, I've extracted some statistics and project highlights for the, this full report. I hope to have my full edited annual report ready to share with LC and PIACAP participants by the end of November. Um, a quick word on acquisitions. In FY 2021, the Islamabad office acquired 39,605 pieces of bibliographic materials for LC and participants. That's an overall 5.9% decrease compared to last year. Uh, there were four main factors that contributed to this decrease. First, as I just mentioned earlier, our office has not yet resumed outstation acquisitions travel in Pakistan. Secondly, many of our non-commercial publication sources continue to restrict visitor entrance to their establishments. Uh, most have resumed some level of on-site activity, but continue to be slow to send us new publication lists for consideration. The third reason is that this year, new procedures and routes for inbound shipments coming to the office from Afghanistan and Iran both had to be tested and implemented. Um, in the interest of time, pl uh, please refer to m the full report for this meeting, which I sent out. There's a section called shipping 
a library materials to LC Islamabad office. Um, <clears throat> and finally, number four, our, the fourth reason is that our Afghanistan vendors were unable to safely work in the last quarter of FY 2021. Uh, as the Taliban forces moved into Kabul last August, each closed their shop temporarily and went into hiding. Um, since that time, um, each of them has requested, each has requested uh, our office assistance in applying for P2 refugee visas to locate to relocate to the US. I'll skip over the next several sections of the report, the full report that I sent out uh, last week and finish with an update on the office's cataloging activities for the past year. Uh, in FY 2021, the Islamabad office cataloged 2,308 monograph serials and other non-book materials. As compared to 2,000 items cataloged in FY 2020, uh, the majority of these publications were in Urdu, uh, 772, Persian, 771, English, 341, and Pashto, 248. This actually represents a 15.4% increase in cataloging over our previous year's statistics, which is a significant achievement considering that a substantial amount of our cataloger time was diverted toward the training of three cataloging staff in B subject and cataloging and classification. The ongoing on-site staffing reductions due to COVID-19 uh, social distancing practices and the loss of the two senior catalogers to SIB resignations. This office, the, uh, this year, the office produced 2,090 shelf-ready titles for LC Washington, as opposed to 1,654 last year. Uh, that's a 26.36% increase. Um, and just finally, a little bit of. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you all seeing me? I just yes. I tapped the screen. Um, as I was mentioning, cat, um, three senior, uh, three cataloger librarian staff are, are, have been trained in B subject cataloging classification this year. Um, all three are scheduled to begin their required mock review process uh, starting next week on November 1st and are hopefully going to become independent in that subject in FY 2022. Um, I think I've finished with early, and if there are any questions that anyone has for me, let me know. I have a question, Fel. Can you hear me? This is Hirad. Yeah. Hi, Hirad. How are you? Hi, hi, hi. I just want to thank you, the staff, for working with us hand in glove. Uh, on a number of things from books, uh, web archiving, dealing with uh, all of the mess that's now unfolded in Afghanistan. And of course, the ongoing lists from Iran, from Iran Farhang every month. Um, I'm just curious now with what's happening with Afghanistan. Um, are the vendors allowed to continue their work or with the Taliban takeover? Is it back to square one or is publishing just under question overall, period? Um, actually, yeah, yeah. I deal a little bit with what, what you've, um, a little bit with those questions in the full report, but yes, I'm happy to answer um, as to what extent I can. Um, the, the P2 visa process was a real learning experience and, and continues to be for for me and my one contact, official contact staff person in Islamabad. Uh, together, we've been sort of trying to learn this process as we go along. The um, the status there, there were four uh, vendors or, early, or prior vendors that approached us about going through this process. Um, our current vendors are still in the country. As far as we know, um, as of yesterday, um, we've gotten contracts signed from our, our vendors. They have reopened their bookshops. They don't. They themselves are hoping to continue the, to run the businesses, but they also are still trying to get out of the country. Um, 
we are also th this will be as I told uh, my boss in Washington Beecher uh, last week it will be just take one step at a time so we have the signed we have the signed bibliographic agreements um, from the vendors we are now we've received a couple of lists um, I have asked um, the head of acquisitions to look at those lists and see if he if he feels there is any self-censorship going on I don't know at this point um, we will place orders and the next step the next challenge will be how will we get these materials we had arranged something earlier in this year we were all excited because the first time in four years the embassy in Kabul had agreed to again ship you know take publications from our local vendors, box them up and send them to our the, the embassy in Islamabad to our office. This was working beautifully until the middle of July. And um, at that time, there was a, um, as I mentioned in the Fuller report, there was a, a shipment that kept getting bumped because of human cargo. Uh, so that shipment did finally make it out of the office in August, I mean, it made it out of the embassy to our office in August. The problem that we're running into now is payment and banks being closed temporarily. So to, to sum up, at this point in time, if we are able to, if the vendors are able to apply, supply publications, we are going to try to order them. If we are able to get them to ship to the office, then we will have to worry about whether or not we can figure out how to pay the vendors. So all of these are unknowns at the moment, but if we are able to get the publications into the office and can figure out how to pay them, then um, the shipping, you know, processing and shipping out to uh, the U.S. will be easy. I'll, I'll keep the group informed as we know more, um, but that's that's pretty much all I, I'll, that's up to date as of, you know, this week getting those signed agreements. Thank you, Phil. Um, it's a thankless uh, place to be. I really appreciate everything you, you specifically and your staff are doing. Thank you. Thank you. I think it is, John. The, the, there, sorry, there was one, there was actually, one question um, in the chat maybe you addressed uh, from Ismail. Uh, okay. Phil, did the SIV holders who left your office get visa through the F SIV program for Afghans? No, um, no, no, the, the, it's very, it's very interesting. I mean, it's a, these were 20 year, these were employees that have worked for the U.S. government for more than 20 years and worked for the embassy for over 20 years. And so, um, it was yes, most, em most embassies in the world have this type of program. Right. Yes. The, um, there is there is a bit of a difference with it with the SIV programs for Afghans. You know, there are different types of these visas. The only one that even in theory our office was able, you know, everyone thought we could do it. So we kept getting, you know, I, I literally had like 16 or 17 people approaching me, you know, the family, the wife, the girlfriend, the, the fiance of, you know, a book vendor's a member of the family. But we are only able to. Um, it's very, very restricted. Either the person had to have worked for our office or uh, the and the only visa that we could re refer them to for is a P2, um, P2 refugee visa. And most of, you know, I we're trying to do what we can, but I don't, I'm not so hopeful myself because you know, at the end of the day, we get through the whole process, and then I have to uh, I have to certify that the person worked for us forty hours full time, and yeah. So 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 yeah. So basically, in a nutshell, at U.S. embassies where the offices are located, it's the locally employed staff, the Egyptian, Pakistani, who are working directly with the embassy, which includes Library of Congress are eligible for these special immigration visas, but uh, out vendors, contractors, et cetera, may not necessarily, or usually are not uh, 
the symbol. I mean, the SIV gets a lot of press simply because of what happened in Afghanistan, but that program has been existing for many, many years now. That's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Fell? Okay. How about we uh, move to? Uh, um, I'm sorry, that was Hong. Hong is next. Yes. Hi, yes. Um, hi. Excuse me. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ho Tang Moore. I am um, head of the uh, um, Middle East and South Asia section uh, at the Library of Congress. Um, originally, my boss, uh, Jessen Zoom, is be uh, presenting right now. However, she let me go first because I have to leave um, at uh, one o'clock. So, um, uh, this is going to be a little bit awkward because I'm using some of her slides and um, I was hoping that sh she would explain her slides first so that I wouldn't have to explain her slides. But uh, uh, here, here goes. I'm going to show you my screen. Uh, Hong, no worries. Okay. <laughs> do, yeah, do what uh, you feel uh, comfortable right. and uh, uh, we'll make sure to cover it in the end. No worries. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm not sure I'm doing this right. Um, hold on. We can see your slide fine. Okay. Um, okay. Um, like I said, uh, my name is Hong Tam Moore. I am head of the uh, Middle East and South Asia section. Um, I'm here to... Uh, give you a report on what my um, or, or, or the section uh, did last year. Um, so this is a, this is just in slide. So I'm going to um, present it uh, as mine. Um, so this, we, um, we work with uh, four field offices out of six. And uh, we, um, uh, the section uh, receives materials from um, the four uh, field offices and uh, process, uh, do the, the end stage processing before we send them to uh, the custodial divisions. Um, the middle, MESA is a short, for, is short for Middle East and South Asia section. Oh, the, the region we cover is so vast and it's hard to um, explain just in words. So I'm gonna show you um, a map to give you a, a visual context of um, uh, how vast our um, empire is. Um, so um, the uh, regions that we cover which stretches from uh, the Pacific all the way to uh, Atlantic, um, blue Southeast Asia, Red, South Asia, um, orange, Islamabad, um, and uh, green, um, Cairo. So uh, for the purpose of the, this presentation, I'm gonna cover only these two regions here. We also um, acquire books from uh, Central Asia in yellow, uh, Mongolia. Um, we don't have field offices in these two regions. So we have, uh, we use a, a vendor in each um, of these places to send us materials um, and we catalog them from scratch. Um, we also acquire, um, we don't have vendors from um, in Sweden to uh, acquire Persian materials published outside of Iran, mainly in Europe. Um, uh, Fedosi is located in Sweden. Uh, we also have a, uh, uh, a vendor in uh, Los Angeles uh, that acquires Persian materials published in North America. This is similar to a, a map that um, William uh, pointed out earlier. And um, I just wanted to, um, um, you know, uh, show that uh, out of six, well, my section um, works with four. So Cairo, um, 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 Williams and, and Fell's office acquires materials, catalogs, 
catalog them and then send them to uh, to um, Washington to my section to finish end stage um, processing. Um, and after we finish the um, end stage processing, we send them to um, African and Middle Eastern Division. And um, um, I'm sure that um, Jen will, will talk more about that uh, later. Uh, the other division uh, that my section uh, works with, collaborate with, uh, is Asian Division. Uh, but that's out of scope of, of this uh, presentation. As of September, the end of September, um, we have about uh, less than 13,000 pieces uh, uh, work on hand. Uh, this includes um, serials, um, issues, as well as um, monographs. Um, in addition to um, cataloging materials um, from um, you know, gifts and um, from donors uh, and, or processing materials from field offices. We also participate in special calendar projects for AMED or, or African Medicine Division. Um, these are the projects that uh, we um, uh, participate in. And I'm gonna mention briefly what they are. Uh, uh, Justin probably will explain um, about that uh, further down. Uh, Next week also. So the Franklin Book Program um, collection uh, is a special collection of books in foreign languages translated from English language books for the purpose of helping developing countries learn about America, its people, and its culture. This project is now complete. Approximately 3,000 dot titles in Arabic and Persian were fully cataloged by um, Amal Morzi, Iman Wasif, and Michael Chayat, three of our um, catalogers. Uh, they were routed to conservation for conservation work and then to Cabin Branch for storage. Uh, the second um, uh, project that we engaged in uh, was a cataloging of Arabic books from Cairo. Amal and Iman um, assist the Cairo office with original cataloging of Arabic materials, monographs, um, like Cairo sent to Washington to um, help reduce its backlog. Uh, Missouri Collection uh, uh, is a collection purchased by the Library of Congress in June 1945 with the assistance of Dr. Charles Watson, retiring president of the American University of Cairo, and Dr. Edwin Calvert. Calverly of Harford Theological Seminary. This collection estimated 5,000 imprints and, and manuscripts, almost all in Arabic. Amal worked closely with recommending officer Mohanad Sali in Ahmed Division and Joan Weeks Division to process this massive collection. During um, the last fiscal year, Amal completed 267 records overall, and um, that's roughly about 50% of the entire collection since 2017. Um, that's, that's a huge um, um, uh, progress there. Um, the last project uh, is the Persian Language Digitization Project. The goals of this project were access and preservation of unique Persian manuscripts, lithographic books, early imprints, and ornate books bindings. Michael Chayat and our former um, staff, now volunteer, Alan Mayberry, uh, worked with Ahmed uh, on this project, um, but the progress slowed down because of the pandemic and Michael was pulled away to work on um, two other projects, more urgent projects. Um, Another highlight um, was that during the pandemic, uh, a lot of shipment, a lot of boxes were shipped um, to the Library of Congress 
before the Library of Cong Congress shut down. And so um, they uh, were housed in a temporary location um, uh, for us to process. Well, when the library reopened for staff to come in to um, process the materials, we had nearly 1,000 boxes to, um, to clear with few staff on site. Um, we were overwhelmed with, with um, processing work, um, but we collaborated with uh, acquisition staff um, and uh, we managed to finish um, clearing 1,000 boxes, nearly 1,000 boxes in just three weeks, uh, which would have taken us about three months. Um, so that, that was huge relief. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Jesslyn for that, for coordinating uh, that project. Uh, this is a, oh, just, uh, unfortunately, I don't have more pictures. This is the only picture I have, a well, clear one of um, the, the boxes that came in um, um, during the pandemic. And uh, this is just half, this is not 1000 here, just half of well, maybe just 250 um, of the total number of boxes that um, we had to clear. Um, so um, uh, everything is now processed and moved over to African and Middle Eastern Division. Um, for 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 um, uh, last year, uh, these are some of the subject headings. Um, NISA staff um, uh, proposed and uh, were accepted by the Library of Congress. Um, there were a lot more, um, but I only have um, uh, one slide, so I'm gonna. Uh, that's all I list. And these are some classifications that we proposed and were accepted by um, the um, uh, cataloging, cataloging um, office, policy office. Um, the staff also participate in um, um, or, 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 or uh, offering their expertise to people outside and inside the Library of Congress uh, in, in the library community. Uh, Michael Chayat, for example, I'm not sure if he's here, but um, he is a, a Kurdish um, expert and he um, taught Kurdish on Zoom twice a week. Um, and uh, he also um, um, taught Kurdish to Washington and overseas staff. Um, Amal Morzi uh, participated in, uh, I, th she, I think she um, is, I think she's here. Um, she was very active in Mela, and she was chair of the um, um, a Mela committee, um, which ended last fiscal year. Um, and she's also a test, a Biframe tester for Arabic materials. Iman Wasif is also, is also a, a Biframe tester for Arabic um, books. Uh, Hussein uh, Yusuf Yunazi. Um, uh, is uh, an expert in Persian, Pushto, and Kurdish languages. And uh, he provided uh, assistance to uh, people inside and outside the Library of Congress on these languages. Um, so here are a few of, um, a few staff um, uh, that work with materials from Cairo and Islamabad. Um, these are from the names that I mentioned earlier, Michael Chayat, um, Alan Mayberry, um, and um, Amal, Iman, and Hussein. Um, this is an old picture of a section um, taken before the pandemic, as you can see, no mass. Um, and we lost three staff um, last year, um, not this year, um, through either transfer or promotion or, or, or retired. The only person missing in this picture is, um, um, is Hussein, this man there. Um, I don't have anything else to report. So um, uh, 
uh, that's my um, contact information. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me by email. I think email is best, uh, but you can also call or uh, fax. And that is all I have to report. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hong. Um, let's see, let me share my screen. Yeah, uh, I guess everybody can see my screen here. Can, can you? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, I'd like to just uh, um, get a credit back to Hong a little bit. Um, he mentioned the coordinating the uh, overseas shipment processing. Um, I think, Hong, you have done a uh, commend commendable job coordinating, um, you know, a huge project. So credits to you and kudos to you. So I want to clarify that. All right. Um, so I'm going to begin my part of the presentation uh, on ASME. So let me uh, bring it out. All right. Um, well, um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jessalyn Zoom. Um, I'm chief of the Asian and Middle Eastern Division. Uh, we regularly refer to ourselves or by others as ASME uh, from the Library of Congress. Alongside of my coll LC colleagues, it is a great pleasure to be with you today and to provide a brief summary of what has happened in our ASME division um, during a year where we really conducting all sorts of business um, entirely in the pandemic environment. Um, like many of you, um, the Library of Congress is, is still operating under phase restoration. Um, the maximum capacity in the library buildings is still enforced and we are still strictly following all the safety and the health protocols. And so they are all still in place. So needless to say, um, it has been really challenging. Um, but comparing to a year ago, as I was composing um, you know, these slides, um, I have to say to myself, we have learned lots of lessons and we have adopted uh, um, some best practices. Um, so in short, it has been a very base, busy year um, here in the division, and for all of us who, um, uh, for all of uh, for some of you uh, who were not at the LC update uh, uh, last year, these next two slides are for you. Uh, so very quickly on the scope of the work, um, as Hong covered earlier, uh, we collect and processes materials in all formats through purchases, exchange, and the gifts uh, from the regions um, that you can um, sort of guess what we cover and our division names, um, and about the topics of, um, uh, of keen interest to the United States Congress and the American public. Um, so that's uh, about the scope of the work. And uh, a bit of the formation of our division, once again, a repeat from last year's update. Uh, the division is comprised of uh, four sections, China section, uh, Israel and Judaica section, Middle East and South Asia section, uh, where Hong just uh, um, you know, uh, gave a report, and Northeast Asia section. All right. Um, trying to um, fill some blank pages <laughs> as, um, you know, uh, William um, started in his presentation. Um, out of the blank pages, as I was trying to reflect what uh, we have uh, accomplished in this um, pandemic year as a division, um, I guess I can boldly um, say that we have accomplished um, in the following five categories, starting with acquisition. Um, so um, despite of all the challenges that you and we have all experienced during the pandemic period, 
um, the division fulfilled all of its acquisitions responsibilities amazingly, um, obligated nearly 100% of allocated annual, annual appropriations uh, for library collections uh, in a timely manner. Um, ASME, all of ASME sections maintained active relationship uh, with a range of non-purchase exchange partners uh, to acquire whether it's uh, um, government publications, uh, whether it's a private or institutional schol scholarly collections, so on and so forth. On to the second bullet point, if um, you would follow uh, through the, uh, the slides here, expand collecting of electronic resources and digital content. The division continued to uh, forge ahead with the expansion of acquiring electronic resources and uh, um, developing staff uh, expertise uh, in this area. Um, needless to say, uh, we can't do this alone. Um, so um, working closely with the two custodial divisions, uh, meaning the African and uh, Middle Eastern division and the Asian division, the two custodial divisions that we work closely with, um, the section acquired more than 200 electronic resources uh, in the form of a subscription, uh, one-time purchase database, and ebook in physical 2021. Uh, building on the success of acquiring ebooks via approval plan with a vendor in Korea, and to further expand digital collecting, uh, the Northeast Asia section have successfully established two ebook acquisitions programs with Japan and Korea using uh, the approval plan fund. These acquisitions have not only expanded library collections, um, they embody staff's commitment to fulfill libraries' digital collecting plan strategic objective in building a wor world-class collection in digital form. Onto the third bullet, contribute to the area to the area reach reduction through collaboration uh, with custodial divisions and other offices in the library services. Um, I guess we call it unit service unit. Um, ASME contributed to the reduction of arrearages through collaboration with the custodial divisions while keeping up with the current receipt cataloging. Um, some of the major projects Hong already um, mentioned, and I will add a few more here. Um, they are um, Hebrew rare and non-rare cataloging contract, Hebrew in Canabulic project, um, the others in the Asia Pacific rim or Asia South and Southeast Asia rim um, um, that are on my list here are Southeast Asian newspaper on uh, microfilm, um, Chinese rare book project, and old Japanese legal material. Um, I'll just also very briefly mention that whenever time allows, our staff also have a pitch in to update the pre-mark records, those uh, who are in the cataloging um, uh, uh, area, um, you, um, you know, you understand fully what uh, the pre-mark um, uh, records uh, look like. All right, uh, let's see, we are on to the next bullet. Uh, play leadership role in um, standardizing romanization to improve access and discoverability of non-Latin script materials. As a division that handles most of the library's non-Latin script materials, ASMIN played a le leadership role in developing and implementing the procedures to standardize romanization of non-Latin script. Um, I should add a note here that some of our colleagues or my colleagues from LC uh, who are attending the session have contributed in this work. So kudos to those of you. Um, one particular instance in this, uh, 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 under this bullet or for this year's accomplishment is that after almost two years of a collaboration uh, with the American Library Association, ALA, um, 
uh, the acquisitions and bibliographic access directory um, jointly, uh, together with the ALA, jointly developed the, um, wrote, uh, the revised procedural guidelines for the proposed new or revised romanization table. Um, this is really to resume the romanization table review work, which were put on hold for some, which were put on hold for some years uh, prior. Um, so um, the implementation of this round of reviewing guidelines was implemented last May, and since then several proposals have been received and are currently under review. Um, I will add that this initiative. Uh, really leverages um, the language and the subject expertise, both within the Library of Congress and among stakeholders in the communities such as you, um, in order to address romanization issues and manage the review process. All right, uh, I think we are down to the last bullet. Um, also, Hong mentioned about the serving subject matters, uh, subject, uh, yeah, subject matter experts and providing support to the library community. Um, so as a division, uh, we continue to stay active in that area. And, uh, you know, some of you who are attending this session, once again, uh, thanks for the great contribution to the community. All right, um, let's see. Uh, now here are the our numbers, I should say, as a division. Um, I think I won't go into the details. Uh, they are very self-explanatory. I hope I can, you know, um, sort of um, uh, pass through these slides uh, quickly, but I will, uh, uh, you know, want to share with you a bit of, um, uh, I guess as a comparison to see where we are, um, you know, how we have done in terms of um, acquiring uh, for library collections, as well as achieving cataloging completions in the past three years, 1920 and 21. Uh, so this one is a is on the uh, purchase and non-purchase end for the acquisitions. If you look at the, um, the gray bars for the past three years, the overall uh, expenditure increased almost by 10% well from the previous year, FY20. Um, well, the total pieces uh, that we purchased or brought in were um, dropped. Uh, by nearly 7%. Um, so the division acquired more electronic resources uh, in the past year. I think that contributed to the trend of, um, you know, you may say paying more and getting less that kind of uh, notion um, in the past physical year. So that's our acquisition. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, actually, I did not mention the uh, the non-purchase. Actually, it's also noticeable that you see the uh, increase um, in the volume or the receipt um, for the non-purchases. So this tells that uh, we worked hard and uh, we did our best in bringing more non-purchase, uh, in other words, exchange and gifts, uh, 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 for the library collection uh, comparing to um, the last year. And this one is our cataloging uh, accomplishment. Uh, the chart, um, sorry, um, the chart shows ASME as a division cataloging accomplishment uh, in both absolute numbers that you uh, see on the vertical bars as well as a, as a percentage of overall ABA directory output as a percentage here in the following categories. So here at the bottom, you see the total cataloging completions, uh, authority creation for the new name authority record, modified authority record, and then finally bib uh, bibliographic file maintenance. Um, so um, you can, um, if you are interested in, um, uh, uh, you can review the slides to see, um, you know, where we are, uh, what the trends and uh, what the reasons that um, were caused, which 
which I think <laughs> uh, uh, I'm about to say that I think one of the main, main reasons you see the fluctuation, especially the decrease, is due to the loss of staff members. Um, so, um, so I think I'm going to move on to the next slide. And this one is the work on hand. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, yep, so this is the work on hand. And again, this is uh, um, uh, where we are as a division, not by section, but as a division overall. And you see, we have the three categories covered. One is titles with already, uh, uh, already with uh, initial bibliographic control record, and then uh, titles that without IBC records, as well as the serial issues to be checked in. And uh, overall, you see, um, you know, how we are doing um, as a full end of fiscal year 2021. Um, the titles with IBC had a big increase, while the serious issues to be checked in uh, decreased. Um, the uh, titles with IBC um, without IBC also uh, seen, uh, saw slightly um, decrease. I um, like to show this chart because I think this um, area um, uh, bars uh, uh, give you a clear picture of uh, where we are in terms of work on hand by section. So once again, if you look at the area covers um, on your right on this uh, um, uh, colored bar uh, graph here, um, you, you can see the trend uh, for MISA or Middle East and the South Asia section, as well as Israel and Judaica section, the trend of work on hand, on hand um, are coming down a little bit, while the China and Northeast Asia section, the areas, um, the trend of the area covered as of the end of fiscal year are getting bigger. And uh, uh, you know, as the head of the division, um, I can easily uh, tell that where uh, we have lost most of our staff. Um, so um, thank you for your interest um, in seeing our statistics here. And this, uh, 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 this page or this slide and the next slide um, is the work on hand statistics by language. And as you can see, um, the language, uh, the languages that are made uh, uh, to the top five are Chinese, uh, Hebrew and Yiddish, Armenian, uh, Korean, and Japanese. Of, uh, once again, um, these um, fluctuate year by year, and uh, you know there are many reasons, but I think um, this at least gave us an overall picture of, of where we are and where the help is needed. And I won't go into the detail, but uh, these uh, slide, this one and the previous slide pretty much covers most of the languages. Um, that um, the division uh, works with. All right, uh, so ending with some challenges and opportunities. I think uh, we face some similar challenges as you all do in terms of loss of staff. Um, I think I will also add that, um, you know, um, uh, the loss of staff also, I think, um, has um, its... Uh, I would say ramifications, um, you know, um, the experiences that they carry uh, with them um, also have lost. Um, also the knowledge transfer is, um, you know, is something that's also very challenging uh, when you lose a staff member. The other two challenges um, in my mind is that, um, you know, we are acquiring more and more electronic resources and digital content. And our staff are, you know, are, are still, um, you know, uh, needing a lot of training and gaining the experience in processing materials in those areas. And uh, once again, um, uh, uh, to my colleagues who are in the cataloging realm, um, you know, BibFrame has been with us and the new RDA toolkit is also um, uh, with, um, I wouldn't say with us, but these are the new, um, uh, 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 you know, cataloging instructions or the new directions that, um, you know, we are moving toward in terms of providing metadata. Um, so definitely these are the new challenging area that we need 
need to learn, we need to um, you know, adopt. Um, well, uh, with all the challenges, I do like to end with a high note of, uh, 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 of my presentation. And I want to uh, acknowledge um, the amazingly dedicated staff that we have in the division. I think with that and with their linguistic and subject matter expertise, I think we will continue to adapt and grow. Um, I think that's all I have. Um, so I'm happy to take questions at the very end. I think I'm probably over my time. So over to John. Thank you very much for that, Jessalyn. I'm uh, delighted to hear about my colleagues in the Ask Me section. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and um, bring up the rear. I hope everyone uh, is still, uh, maybe they need to stand for a moment or something to, uh, from sitting so long. But um, I wanted to start out today. We're in the African and Middle Eastern Division Near East section. And uh, I'm starting out with an image of our reading room as it is today. Uh, I've already been working with two researchers today uh, in the reading room this morning. And um, I'm going to go into more detail in a few minutes about how we're actually um, doing all of this uh, in this current environment. But uh, just first of all, I wanna give you a little overview. The African and Middle Eastern Division, as we are, we call Ahmed, uh, is organized a little bit differently than uh, Jocelyn's ASME section, division, sorry. Um, we're in the General and International Collections Directorate, which means uh, we serve as a major research center and the custodial division for the collections from Africa, the Middle East, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. And uh, we are in three sections. We have the African section, which covers all of Sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, we cover the Hebraic section, which covers Jewish studies worldwide. And uh, the Near East section, which is North Africa uh, with the Arabic language scripts, uh, all of the traditional Middle East, Turkic uh, and Iranic Central Asia. So that would be Turkey and Iran, but also the Turkic and Iranic speaking countries of Central Asia. Uh, I wanted to bring up a little image uh, since I'm on site today. Our um, Near East or African and Middle Eastern division sits, this is the Supreme Court. Straight across the street from here is the US Capitol. We're on the second floor in this corner of the Jefferson building. And my office today on the second floor is pointing in, inward toward the stack area. Um, but the outward area, if I walked across the hallway, would face out to that um, part of the Supreme Court. Um, and then our stacks are throughout the Jefferson building um, on major decks. I wanted to start out uh, last uh, May, May la, in uh, October last year, uh, I presented and um, Dr. Lenisa Kitchener presented at MELA, keynote speaker. Uh, but just to recap for a few people that are new, she came to us in August of 2020, having served previously as the Director of Education and Scholarly Initiatives at the Smithsonian's uh, National Museum of African Art. She's an African uh, specialist, uh, but she's uh, traveled extensively throughout the Middle East. Um, she was associate director for programs in the Ralph Bunch International Affairs Center at Howard University. And one thing I wanted to point out is that although she onboarded in August 2020, uh, on June 25th, she finally met all of our staff in person. Uh, we had, because of the pandemic and um, remote work and uh, all of this isolation, had not met her staff in person. We meet over Zoom, but not actually face to face. So uh, that has been somewhat of a challenge throughout the year. Uh, today, she was actually filming a segment for VOA to uh, project into Africa in the next uh, couple of weeks. 
We also were very fortunate this year to onboard two NERI section staff. Uh, Hoda Dayton is an Arab world specialist librarian. Uh, Hoda uh, is from Saudi Arabia originally and has been helping us uh, with an immense amount of uh, both reference services and on our collections. Uh, previously, she had worked with a contractor in cataloging law materials and uh, brought with her a, a wealth of experience in processing the collections. We were also uh, very fortunate on board Dr. Uh, Kachador, Kachik as he prefers to be called, Muradi, who's our new Armenian and Georgian area specialist librarian. And uh, he has brought so many wonderful uh, contacts and networks with uh, acquisitions of gifts for the uh, collections and uh, working through so many of our researcher requests and, uh, virtually and uh, now in person. I also want to go ahead and introduce our entire new section to you. Uh, we have Abdullah Ahmed, who is our Arabic collection librarian. Uh, he, behind the scenes, is the one who is processing bundles and bundles of newspapers that have come in from all of the regions we cover. Uh, Jocelyn talked about the collections they're processing are primarily monographs and uh, bound periodicals. Uh, it's, we are processing the bundles of newspapers that have come in from the Cairo office as well as the Islamabad office uh, through an amazing amount of leverage. And uh, so he's been extremely helpful in uh, getting the data sheets together. We're trying to microfilm the newspapers so that we can continue to send those on interlibrary loan. Um, we are, and I'll show later, what we're doing with other materials that he's helping us process. And then Hoda, uh, as I explained, is the Arab World Librarian, helping us with Ask a Librarian requests, all sorts of uh, processing uh, problems that we're encountering with some of the materials. Uh, Harad Dinavari, uh, he's well known to a lot of you. He's our Iranian World uh, Specialist Librarian. He's uh, been, uh, asking questions throughout the session. And I'm going to show some of his work about digital projects in a moment. Uh, Crystal Grant is a library technician. And uh, I'm going to show Crystal's work in a little bit about how she's processing the microfilm reels, those newspapers, once they're turned into microfilm, so that you're going to be able to discover them and identify uh, which uh, runs of newspapers and the dates that we actually hold in the collection. Uh, Kachik, again, Armenian area specialist, Georgian area specialist, and uh, Dr. Mohanad Salhi, our Arab world specialist. I know he's on this call. I'm going to talk a little bit about his digitization project of the Monstery manuscripts. He's also worked extensively on the newspaper processing project, the paperwork that needs to be sent so that they can be accurately microfilmed. Um, we also have Emma Stevens, who's uh, language expertise in Arabic has been instrumental in processing so many of our bound uh, periodicals, those statements telling us, telling the world which issues, the runs of our periodicals. And then I'm head of the section and I also cover Turkic. I'm the Turkic area specialist. So um, when the researchers come into the reading room with uh, any of that, I uh, just put on a different hat, go out and help them with that. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of uh, talk about how we've uh, returned to work on site uh, during COVID. I know a lot of uh, the librarians are working with how to reopen uh, reading rooms, reopen services. So uh, just briefly, uh, the library's implemented this phased reopening. And uh, during this phase one, uh, it was very limited staffing, mostly for securing and IT maintenance. And we found telework projects for all of our uh, African and Middle Eastern division staff. Um, in, uh, it's been actually very fantastic opportunity to process uh, the materials. 
during this, this limited staffing. Um, during phase two, more staff came on site. So we had a, a hybrid environment where staff were on site, um, mostly two to three, three days mostly on site and two days in telework. And we had to manage social distancing. Um, so that um, as Jocelyn uh, mentioned, uh, we had to, if two people were working on uh, site on a day, I couldn't have both of them working on deck three at the same time. We had to socially uh, work in uh, separate areas. And so that was a bit of a challenge, but it gave us an opportunity to work through some of these unprocessed uh, arrearage of newspapers and uh, bound periodicals. Now we're in phase three. Well, it started with phase 3.1, which was limited, um, more people coming on site. Uh, some of the, re the uh, reference staff were coming in uh, two or three days a week uh, to uh, serve articles from uh, different periodicals so they could send those out to researchers would get requests. Um, we also continue to process the material. Right now we're in phase 3.2, which means our reading room is open. And I wanted to go to that. We opened on July 12th, uh, so only a couple months ago. And I wanted to kind of explain the system uh, and it's still in operation today. Uh, researchers have the opportunity to make appointments for a morning session from 9.30 to 12.30. Half an hour, we clean uh, the desks um, and we swap out the materials that they uh, have asked that we provide. Uh, then we have another session from 1 to 4 p.m. And we only have five desks in our uh, reading room available for each session due to social distancing uh, requirements. So this necessitates, um, we had three appointments for this morning and this afternoon we're fully booked. So um, this, we have a scheduling system uh, called LibCal and uh, we make those appointments ahead of time. We do a very thorough reference interview and it includes this know before you go checklist, which includes uh, they have to have uh, an appointment to show the security before they're admitted into the building. Uh, we have a 100% mask um, and they, the only reason mine's not on right this moment is I'm in my office with my door closed. But as soon as we uh, leave any confined space like that, 100% um, mask. And um, they also, the researchers must uh, show this appointment to be admitted and wear a mask. And uh, then they're also given all of the guidance about social distancing, conducting themselves uh, with uh, all the protocols with uh, the local area, Washington DC regional area uh, requests. So what I thought I'd do now is kind of go through some of the work of the division. Uh, we work according to uh, a annual performance goal. Um, it calls the directional plan and the goals and the objectives of the um, section, our nearing section. Uh, this first goal touches on acquisitions. How do we expand the national collection? Well, William talked about the wonderful support he provides in all the materials that are coming in from Cairo and the Islamabad office uh, describe a major part of our Near East uh, section acquisitions. However, um, the Near East section had um, major gifts, gifts donation books from um, all over. In fact, this year, I, I meant to put the number in here, we've got over 350 gift book donations, which is more than we had the previous year. Um, people have gotten used to the idea of sending us things. And um, we're very, very happy with Hong Eds, um, and ASME have uh, agreed that they can be mailed to them um, for acquisitions. And uh, then we are um, providing uh, those gift donations are critical to building collections that uh, we're not receiving through other uh, areas uh, from Cairo or from Islamabad. 
Another major feature is that with end of the year funds uh, that are pooled, uh, we're able to get some very unique and rare materials. And uh, this year, uh, we were able to obtain this Hilarion, a very rare travelogue of the Ottoman Arabia, fascinating with maps and all sorts of descriptions of the, that area of the world in a very unique time of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this photographic collection uh, that Dr. Salhi has obtained is going to be amazing. Uh, all of these old photographs of Cairo and Egypt by the uh, most distinguished photographers of that world, 19th century, very, very unique photographs. And then this manuscript of um, the preacher of al -Quzini, influential Arabic writer's manual, um, is going to be very, very interesting uh, for grammatical topics, stylistic matters. I think it's going to be very, very useful in analyzing uh, some of the manuscripts as well. Another major focus uh, that has been particularly beneficial uh, for TEL work has been web archiving. Uh, this is where we go into DigiBoard and uh, we have done, um, it started a spreadsheet uh, project with our specialists uh, in uh, the initial phases of telework, where uh, would identify websites uh, through the various countries, particularly with COVID-19. Uh, it was an interesting uh, project for some of the Turkic countries. Also, uh, we moved forward with social justice and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and also we had a lot of uh, web archiving uh, collaboration, particularly uh, with Phil Cannon's office uh, with the uh, Afghan. And uh, these are very challenging locations, Iran. And uh, I wanted to everyone, if you can capture that uh, URL uh, at the screen there, or just simply Google search it to identify these web archives that are now on um, the major out, uh, public facing website. Um, and uh, you can access those and uh, the researchers can access them and actually see these archived endangered websites. We've also, uh, uh, this is our primary focus during COVID has been increasing the user discoverability of our collection items. And um, I talked about the microfilming project. Uh, this has been a fantastic year for processing the backlog of Near East uh, section newspaper bundles. When I started in 2015, there were over a thousand boxes of unprocessed. Uh, we've completely uh, and we've completely taken care of that backlog. Um, these have been sent as bundles each month, um, maybe 40 or 50. And um, a lot of the work has been done in a virtual environment. Um, Abdullahi will pull in the data for each bundle and send that to uh, Mahan, who will proceed to process uh, the data sheets. And then those are put on the bundles that are then taken over to uh, the Preservation Reformatting Division to be sent out to uh, Backstage. And uh, then after those are sent, uh, we sent uh, 47 titles this uh, period of time with over 72,304 pages. Um, and we're talking about the fiscal year. So that was from October of last year through September of this year. And we're trying to continue to send our newspapers as we receive them to be microfilmed, uh, primarily so that we can, uh, they're very, very popular in our reading room. Several researchers are using them on our microfilm reading machines today, uh, but we can continue to send those out on interlibrary loan and um, we can make them accessible. One thing that we focused a lot on during uh, the COVID uh, environment is um, our master file of newspapers. Uh, before we can send them out, they have to have uh, the bibliographic record, but they didn't always have uh, the microfilm numbers 
or what we call the newspaper numbers in the records. So Abdullahi uh, continued to work on this master file that we have. And over the year of telework, he increased it from about 281 uh, titles from all of these different countries to 964 uh, titles. And um, this is uh, sorted by country and um, we can tell and it helps us with the processing and speeding it immensely because uh, when we have a bundle to send out, we'll be able to quickly identify the uh, major data numbers that we need to have for that processing. And I wanted to show how this increases the discoverability of the collection. Once those microfilm reels are coming in, uh, we're sorting them into boxes by data order. And then we're creating summary holding statements. Um, I talked about this previously, we had over 47,000 reels, and now we're about two thirds of the way through. And uh, Crystal Grant is a library technician who comes in and um, takes those microfilm reels and creates the summary holding statement. And with that, she's processed over 9,000 reels. And what it means is when you're requesting a newspaper, even if you're uh, offsite in, a, in your libraries uh, throughout uh, our Mela region, uh, you can come in and see that we have, uh, I haven't put the title of this, I just wanted to show you the holding statement. Uh, you can see at a glance that the Library of Congress holds from 1982 to 1998 on this particular title. And that's true of so much of the collection now that you're going to be able to see the date range that we have. And then when you're requesting your uh, material request on interlibrary loan, um, you'll know whether we have the date range you need. You need. Another item that we've worked on discovering uh, our collection items that's been very, very beneficial. Um, we're so overcrowded on our decks, but uh, with the uh, COVID environment, we've sent 7, 000, over 7,000 volumes off-site storage in Cabin Ranch, Maryland, which has uh, immensely relieved the backlog of unshelved items. Uh, so that uh, what this means is uh, materials cannot go off site unless they're perfectly cataloged and discoverable. And uh, for our researchers now in the reading rooms, we request those materials before we set the appointments up for them so we can ensure that the material is available. It usually takes a day, sometimes two days, for those materials to be brought back on site. But we actually absolutely know they're available and uh, can be served to the researchers that way. Also huge during this um, COVID work hybrid situation, um, Emma Stevens has worked through so many of our bound periodicals. We used to have those bundles on the floor. Uh, we've wiped that arrearage completely out. We also had a number that were on the catwalk, we called it. So now we have the, created the summary holding statements and item records for over 24,000 bound serial volumes. And uh, when you look in the catalog, uh, you'll see the title, uh, you'll see the location, but again, uh, you're going to see the date range. And uh, it no longer will say something like no holdings available, or um, we're not, completely finished through some of the Central Asian ones. There was one I went to this morning with a researcher and it just said catalog record available. And I said, well, I'll be happy to go down on the shelf and uh, check for you. And indeed we were able to find the volume four she wanted, but uh, we had not put this holding statement in yet, but before it goes back in the stacks, I intend to put that statement in. So uh, moving forward, uh, we were going to have that for them. Now, uh, another big area has been making collections available online. And uh, we had the periodicals on newsprint digitization project. Uh, we had a backlog of over 417 bundles of periodicals uh, just stacked in the back of the deck since, uh, well, I came on board in 2015. And in FY 2020, 
21, we had amazing opportunity to send these bundles. Um, and we don't normally, we wouldn't loan uh, periodicals on interlibrary loan. Um, pretty much uh, you look at the table of contents, perhaps we can send an article or uh, that. Uh, and one of the challenges, well, they're uploaded in this um, Stacks 3.0 system on the back end of the library. It's not on the public facing because they're under copyright, but um, we've sent all of these uh, 45 titles with over 3,847 issues. But the challenge is uh, you'll see these in the title and in the catalog. However, it's just going to pull a screen up for you that it's access uh, rights restricted content. Uh, when we reopened the reading room, we were able to have uh, a special dedicated workstation to view this content, but uh, it's challenging not to be able to even see if we have the date range yet that uh, would let you know whether, uh, if you're doing research on a particular time period, whether we have that date range available for you. But uh, if particular request, we can go in and check just at least if we have the date range and what has been entered in there. And we're still working on ways to make that more visible for researchers. Here's stacks at a glance about what's in there. Um, you can see the number of ebooks that are in there. This is a, a challenge, uh, newspaper titles. Um, also, I want to draw your attention to the number of languages and the number of countries, because I think these are really relevant to us as we uh, try to determine the content and how to make that more visible. Also, we're working on some digitization projects that i um, very proud that the calligraphy sheet collection has now migrated to the new digital collections platform. And I uh, put the URL in, uh, Google search uh, calligraphy sheet collection library of Congress should bring it up. But uh, this is an amazing collection of the most uh, exquisite Arabic, Persian and Ottoman calligraphy. And uh, it has full metadata and uh, the researchers may uh, really find a lot of very interesting uh, collection items in there. Also, Harad Dinavari, a Persian specialist, has completed phase one of the Persian language project with 180 manuscripts that he launched in March uh, 2019. Now he's moved on to phase two and he's digitized over 145 items over six, of 600 in the rare Persian lithograph collection. And um, this digital collection is available to scholars worldwide and uh, absolutely amazing uh, arrangements and beautiful, beautiful uh, illustrated illuminated manuscripts. And very exciting that the Mohanad Salhi, our Arab world specialist, is he, we talked about, and Jocelyn talked about getting all of those Mansuri manuscripts. They're all finally cataloged which is underpinning the process of digitizing the collections because that's going to provide the metadata. And um, now we're at the cusp of being able to uh, hopefully begin scanning uh, this Mansuri uh, manuscript collection, hopefully before the end of the year. So uh, we're very excited about that. Now I'll talk a bit about uh, delivery of services to our users. Um, this is the reference end of things. I talked about the processing end and now uh, how we serve the readers, researchers. We continue to use the Live Answers platform that uh, replaced the old question point. How did we do this while well, we were teleworking in COVID? Um, we had on-site visits since September, 2020. So a reference librarian perhaps uh, was not assigned to work on site regularly, but uh, you could sign up for an on-site visit. And that way you could copy excerpts for patrons or you could uh, come in and uh, identify some sources, uh, letting people know uh, 
what they could come uh, expect for fulfilling this. But in April 2021, we resumed interlibrary loan services. And to date, we've fulfilled 131 requests. And this um, now allows uh, the researchers, this includes our materials, um, the books, monographs that go out on loan, um, but it can also include uh, photocopying a, a brief, uh, maybe a table of contents or a, a particular article. We're very careful with copyright, but um, if it falls under the interlibrary loan agreement for uh, sharing resources, then we fulfill that. And um, now um, the reading room, actually it was July 12th, I'm sorry about that. I now have access to the collections on site. And um, some other services that we deliver, uh, we have um, services, uh, to the Congress, particularly a member of Congress or congressional staff will come in and ask us uh, for certain things. We definitely have government uh, agencies, State Department employees, um, Department of Commerce that uh, come in with work products that they're working on. We also um, interact with the, for example, National Council on U.S. Arab Relations. Uh, we all uh, very often have scholars from the Woodrow Wilson Center, um, Atlantic Council. We also uh, have services to international librarians, um, through services, um, IFLA, International Federation of Libraries. We also interact uh, with students from universities. Today we have this uh, PhD candidate from Princeton University. Um, we have uh, researchers basically coming in from all over the world, uh, particularly from our regions um, of um, the Middle East. So um, any that are studying the Middle East or uh, Africa will be coming into the Near East, um, African and Middle Eastern Division reading room. Um, also uh, delivery of services to users. Uh, we have social media, Ahmed, um, our uh, Social media expert, Dr. Anji Hao, uh, has the Four Corners blog. And I put the URL up for that. I invite everyone to explore. Uh, it's been a very productive activity during uh, telework. Um, and draw your attention uh, to the blog content frequently goes into depth about a particular collection. And here we're talking about the collaborative approach of all of the uh, archive websites from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, and Tajikistan, uh, just as a focus point. So I invite everyone to uh, look at those. Um, and uh, to round it all out, I'd like to talk about how we support modernization, innovation, and collaboration. Um, we uh, have had several uh, opportunities for our staff to participate and um, gain substantive in-depth knowledge. Uh, many, many of the institutes have sponsored a wealth of experts speaking on Middle East topics. And uh, we're able to attend a quick Zoom hour-long briefing on our regions in the Middle East, and this has been invaluable. We also um, had training on a new system called Mars. It's kind of fun. It even has a Mars motif on it. Um, our materials acquisitions recommending service. We are all um, in their specializations, recommending officers. So uh, we use this tool to acquire those special end of year purchases or uh, materials that are very, very unique or uh, any gaps that we identify in the collection. And um, we participate in the digital transformation workshops. I headed a workshop on digital visualization um, and we experimented with the Tableau visualization software. And I'll just finish up with one of the visualizations that the newspaper current periodical reading room did uh, with that Tableau software that I think pertains to uh, this, it's on their website. Um, you can tell where in the United States, um, for example, Arabic language materials 
are published here in the United States in the diaspora. And so I kind of think that's fascinating as well. Um, and I'll just round it out with that. I'm happy to have and entertain any questions. Uh, so I'll finish it with that and stop sharing. Thank you very much for listening. Anybody have any questions? I put everybody <laughs> It's time for a break. <laughs> I'm happy to entertain any questions. Can anybody hear me? Yes, yes I can. Okay, all right. Um, I'm Carol Jarvis. Um, I, no, my name, um, C. Van Enum, doesn't say much, but uh, but anyway, I, um, I on this last. No presentation by Joan Weeks. I'm, um, I, I, I was just impressed by the the whole idea that 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 all these services, you know, are being done, um, you know, you know, with you know, with COVID nineteen still going on, um, and and um, um, I'm just you know, um, I'm just wondering, you know, how you know, how how is the section able to you know to do that much? Um, it, it, it's like um, I was I was going to be taken on, you know, as a volunteer, um, you know, in the, in, in the Mesa section, you know, over in the Madison building um, this past August. Um, and um, then, then, of course, right after Labor Day, um, uh, you know, I found out that, you know, the volunteers, you know, were on the, you know, couldn't, couldn't come on site. So I, I, I guess, I guess basically speaking, the uh, the uh, the uh, the researchers must be kind of on a higher priority, you know, being able to come on site, you know, you no know, over volunteers. It's just uh, an observation. Yeah. yeah, I'd be happy to address that a little bit um, with this phased reopening and the um, ability to put people in uh, socially distanced areas. Um, the, we, we had capacity with the staff returning on site in the social distancing in our staff area. And what very shortly now we've already put through, um, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. This may not, I'll be trying to be very quick about it, but there's a lot of things that had to happen with bringing people back on site, including uh, a new, telework hybrid uh, laptop that goes into a docking station that you can, if we have to go back home uh, to telework, we, we take it home. I take mine home on a daily basis. I catch up on reports at night. I plug it back in at my desk today. Uh, I have it here in front of me. And um, to provide those to all the volunteers and then um, also to find the workspaces. Our workspaces were deactivated while we were in uh, the full telework situation, all the workspaces had to be reactivated. All the security uh, passwords, uh, all the accounts were frozen and all of that had to be reopened again. And we've done extensive training on many, many processes. Um, that workflow that I detailed um, was, I worked uh, a lot with my staff to streamline the workflow so that it, it could would be a hybrid thing with telework and on-site working hand together. So uh, volunteers will be coming shortly, <laughs> hopefully, very essential. Anyone else, please? Questions? I think I can see chat now. <laughs> this is not so much a question as a more of a sort of statement. As you all know, we are linguistically driven. So it's crucial to realize we go beyond the existing, what is politically seen as Middle East. So Central Asia, 
all of its Turkic languages, and there's plenty from the Uyghurs of China all the way to Azerbaijan, as well as the Iranian languages, be they uh, Persian or Pashto or Amir or wherever, um, Tajik, all of it is covered in this domain. So it goes well and beyond. And also for Europe, um, our wonderful vendors that are supplying, are not just supplying Persian diaspora, but also from the Afghan, uh, Syriac speaking, as well as Kurdish speaking folks, uh, Ferdosi helps us with that. And also in North America, we're getting uh, Persian, but also Syrian and other uh, diaspora communities that live in North America as well. So I just wanted to point that out so that smaller languages don't fall through the cracks. Thank you for that, Harad. Um, and, um, I think that we're very, very happy to uh, provide more connections. I think that's uh, what we're trying to say here from all our, hopefully this has opened up some opportunities for um, connecting with uh, all of our offices, with William, uh, with Fel, with uh, Jocelyn, Hong, all of us uh, hope introducing the Near East section, uh, the area specialist. So uh, just making our uh, collections accessible and available to the researchers. Are there any other follow-up questions? I think we are just about at the eight o'clock hour with time to have a break before vendor showcase. I think that'd be I wonderful um, if everybody's uh, ready to take a little break uh, before the showcase. I, I don't know who is the controller of the meeting. <laughs> I can shut no. it off. It's, yeah, it's I think we can get the recording uh, and we'll see you all in 30 minutes at the Vendors Showcase. Have a nice break. Bye-bye. Have a nice break and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you.